Welcome to uh, my second lecture on uncertainty. Um, so yesterday I gave a bit of an overview of uncertainty in geometric algorithms, where uncertainty comes from, how you can model it, and what you might possibly uh, do with it. Um, and today I'm going to focus on one of those things that you can do with it, and I think one of the most natural things you can try to do when you know your data is uncertain is uh, to compute these error bounds. So you, you want to compute the value, but your input is uncertain, so the output is uncertain uh, as well. So can we compute bounds on the possible value of the, of the output? All right. Um, so just uh, 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 yeah, a slight uh, recap of what this means. Um, I'm only going to, going to talk about structures on point sets. So there are, of course, also geometric structures that take something else than points as input, but uh, points are already interesting uh, enough by themselves, so I'll only talk about points. And on these points, you can compute uh, geometric structures, like uh, the width of a point set. And the width of a point set is defined by um, uh, you take two lines such that all the points lie in the strip between those two lines, uh, two parallel lines, and you measure the distance between those two lines, and now you want to take the smallest such distance over all possible pairs of lines that have the points between them. And the smallest such distance is the width of the point set. And you can see that this line is going, going through two points, and this line is going through one point, and you cannot move them any closer to each other, and you can try rotating them, but it doesn't work. So that's the width of a point set. Um, the diameter of a point set, uh, that's the largest possible distance between any two points in the set. So in this case, distance from this point to this point is the largest possible distance between any two points in the set. And those are the two measures that I will focus on uh, in the rest of the lecture. But there are also other measures on point sets, like uh, maybe, or other structures, like the convex hull, or minimum, minimum spanning tree. Uh, but those things are not uh, numbers, so it's harder to compute error bounds on them. Uh, of course, you could then measure some aspects of them, like the area of the convex hill or the weight of the minimum spanning tree. But the width and the diameter are directly uh, numbers, so it's uh, easier to apply this framework to, to such measures. Um, there are, of course, many, many other possible geometric structures and uh, optimal algorithms to compute them are known, have been known for uh, decades. So now, um, suppose we have imprecise points and uh, I'll model them as regions. Sometimes they will be disks, sometimes they'll be squares, sometimes other regions. Um, we can consider the same structures, but we don't know the, uh, the real answer. So if we want to compute them, the minimum spanning tree, we don't know what it looks like. Maybe it's this, but maybe the points are somewhere else and it's actually this and it looks completely different. And we don't know what the, the true answer is, so what can we do? Uh, here's another option. Um, so what can we do? Well, you already saw this slide yesterday. I'm just repeating it uh, because this is what we'll talk about for the rest of the, the day. Um, so you can define some measure on a set of points that gives you a real number. Um, and then you can uh, uh, yeah, compute the largest and possible, smallest and largest possible value of this number. So for example, you could compute the area of the bounding box, and this is the largest possible area of a bounding box, and this is the smallest possible area of a bounding box. Um, or you could look at the diameter, and uh, this is the largest possible value of the diameter, where you see that we've put two points very far away from each other. And this is the smallest possible value of the diameter. And you can see here there's some interesting structure going on, and uh, I'll define this uh, uh, and derive this later in uh, the lecture. Um, we could talk about the convex hull perimeter. So this is the maximum perimeter convex hull, and this is the minimum perimeter convex hull. Uh, the weight of the minimum spanning tree, this is the maximum weight minimum spanning tree, and this is the minimum weight minimum spanning tree. And you can do this uh, uh, for all kinds of measures that you want. Um, and as I said, today I will talk about uh, diameter and the width. And then at the end I will uh, also talk a little bit about um, binary measures, so not 
things that compute a number, but things that are either true or false. Um, but let's start with uh, the diameter, okay? So the diameter, as I said, it's simply the largest possible distance between two points in your set. And now we have imprecise points and we want to compute the largest and the smallest possible value of this uh, number. All right, so let's start with the largest possible diameter. Um, and I'm going to start simple and say my, my imprecise points are squares. So I have a set of squares in the plane. Uh, they can overlap each other. They don't have to have the same size, but they're all squares. And now I uh, uh, want to compute the largest possible diameter. And the first observation is that uh, the large, large, largest possible observ the largest possible diameter always occurs between a pair of corners of these squares. So I can look at only the corners of the squares and just throw away the squares themselves and now consider these as discrete imprecise points. So uh, for every square, I pick one of the four corners and this gives me a point set and I want to maximize uh, the distance between two points um, in this set, but I only have to consider the corners and not the interiors of the squares. Okay, um, so what do we do? We simply compute first the diameter of all the possible corners in my set. Okay, so I just look at this whole set of corners as a single point set and I compute the diameter of that. I can do that in uh, n log n time. Um, and I find some uh, diameter. Now my first observation is that if this diameter I find uses corners of different squares, then I'm done, okay? Because this distance is the largest possible distance between any two corners in my set. So definitely I'm not gonna be able to place my points in any way such that I get an even larger distance. So if this distance can be realized by uh, placing one point in this square and one point in this square, then I'm done, All right? If these points are from different squares, then we're happy we managed to compute the largest possible diameter in n log n time by just using an existing algorithm. Uh, but of course, it could be that we are uh, unlucky and that um, we find two points that are corners of the same square. And if they're corners of the same square, they must be diagonally opposite corners, okay? So it looks like this. And we have one very big square, and now I, I run my uh, traditional algorithm and I find that uh, the diameter is formed by these two points. Now this is not the right answer because I cannot actually place my points one point in this square, one point in this square, and one point in this square such that this is the diameter of my point set because I would have to place two points in the same square and that's not allowed. So if this happens then we have a problem. Um, but fortunately it's not a very big problem because uh, in this case, if I find, uh, find this, then I have two possibilities. Uh, so what can we do? Well, um, there are two possible cases. We find this big square S, and we can observe that the optimal solution either does use a point for, from S, or it does not use a point from S. Okay, that's kind of obvious, two possibilities. Um, so case one, let's say that S does not actually contribute to the largest diameter. So we find these two points uh, uh, when we run the, uh, the traditional algorithm, but let's assume that, these, uh, that no point from S actually contributes to the real optimal solution. Well, then what can we do? Well, we just throw away uh, S, so maybe this is the real optimal solution, right? There's a point here and a point here, and this distance is the longest distance that you can actually get by picking points from different squares. So how do we find it? Well, uh, we just throw away S, and again we compute the diameter of all the uh, uh, corners of all the remaining squares. Okay, and then I, uh, I claim that it cannot happen again that we find po two points that belong to the same square. If we once found this big square S, and um, I throw away 
S completely and I do it again, then, uh, then I must find two points that belong to two different squares, which means that in this case we are done. Okay? The other case is that uh, S does contribute to the, uh, the largest possible diameter, and this is actually an easier case because in this case, uh, so maybe this is the solution, right? So now I have some small squares here and here. Uh, and the optimal solution uses one corner of S and one corner of another square. But this we can simply test by saying, well, if S does contribute, there's only four possibilities. So for each possibility, I just compute the distance to every other possible corner, and this is only a linear number. So I only have to compare a linear number of uh, values, and I can also do this uh, in linear time. So the whole thing takes only n log n time. Yes? Um, yes, this is the disjoint square case. Yes, uh, yes that's, a, that's a very good point, actually, yes. I, I forgot to mention, so we're uh, uh, talking about the disjoint square case. Otherwise, of course, uh, if I delete S, then there could be another big square that's just slightly smaller than S that has the same property, and then, uh, then the algorithm does not work. Yes, that's a very good point. Yes. Um, okay. So, any questions uh, uh, about this? So the largest diameter of a set of squares can be computed in linear time. Maybe this should be n log n time. Sorry? Yes, so this should be, should be this joint square. So, so I'm uh, not being very careful in writing down the correct theorem here, I'm sorry. So um, the same approach also extends to uh, polygonal regions. So if I don't have squares but uh, other, polygon, other polygons, then the same approach works. I still have this observation that I can look at only the corners. Um, however, it does not extend to disks, which is another uh, uh, natural model of uncertainty. Um, but for disks, we can actually also uh, uh, compute the solution in linear time using an even simpler algorithm um, because basically for disks, um, if I have two disks that define the uh, diameter, then I just have to look at the, the line that connects the centers of those disks and extend it to the, to the edges of the disks. Um, so for disks, we can also compute the largest diameter um, efficiently. Right, so the point I want to uh, get across is largest diameters are actually easy to compute. Um, smallest diameters, on the other hand, are not so easy. And maybe the, uh, the intuition behind this is that the diameter is already a measure that maximizes something. The diameter is the maximum of distances between two points. And now we want to maximize a measure that already maximizes something and that's somehow easy to do. We just have to place two points in a set of regions that are as far away from each other as possible. However, if we want to compute the smallest diameter, then we are minimizing a measure which itself maximizes something. And this makes it more tricky. So now we want to uh, minimize uh, the diameter of a point set, but this doesn't mean that we just want to find two points that are as close to each other as possible. No, it means that we want to find a point set whose maximum distance is as small as possible. And this, uh, this clash between taking minimum and maximum makes it a harder problem. And we will see later that in the case of the width, it's the other way around. So the width is something that minimizes uh, a distance, which means that computing the smallest width is easy and computing the largest width is much harder. Okay, so for smallest diameter, <coughs> Um, first observation is for smallest diameter, we, we cannot, can no longer just look at the corners of our squares. We have to look at, um, <coughs> at uh, the entire squares. So uh, it could be that the smallest diameter just looks something like this. So I have two squares and I place two points 
very close to each other and now the diameter of this point set is these two points. But could also look something like this. So if I have these three squares, then the optimal solution actually looks like this. So I place these two points at the corners somehow as close to each other as possible. But then this point, I need to balance such that this distance is exactly the same as this distance. Because if I move this point up, then this distance becomes longer. And if I move it down, then this distance becomes longer. So this is the uh, solution which has the uh, smallest possible diameter. And this can happen uh, more than once as well. So I can have a set of four squares like these four. And now from this point, I have to go somewhere to this edge and then somewhere down to this edge and then up to this corner again. Um, and I have to make sure that all of these distances are exactly the same length to get the optimal solution. Okay. Now, this kind of structure I will uh, call a star. So why do I call this a star? Well, uh, the name kind of comes from this configuration. So if my regions are not squares, but they can be any kind of region, then in principle we could have a situation like this where I have to balance uh, the distances between all pairs of points. And this kind of looks like a star, so that's why we call it a star. Um, so this is a star. And uh, uh, my lemma here is now that if the regions are squares, then a star can have at most two bands. Okay, so these things, this is a star, this is a star, and this is a star, and this is a star with two bands. And I say I cannot have more than two bands. Okay, so why is this the case? Well, it's actually fairly easy to see. Um, if I make a bend in a star, then I always reflect on a horizontal or a vertical edge. So if I started by going, uh, what is it, southwest, and now I make a bend, then after the bend I'm going southeast. And maybe I start by going southeast, I make a bend, and I'm going northeast, and I make a bend, and I'm going northwest. But if I would make another bend from here, I would either have to go um, southwest, which would mean I have to go this way, but that means that I'm going farther away from this point than I was before, so I would get two points that are too far away from each other, or I would have to make a bend going uh, northeast, so I'd be going this direction, but then I'd be creating two points here that are too far away from each other. Okay, so it's not possible. The only way I could make a bend here and still maintain a set of points with the same diameter would be by going in this direction. But this is not possible because uh, I would have to reflect on an edge that's not horizontal or vertical. Right? So because these squares are axis aligned and I only have horizontal and vertical edges, uh, I can make this observation that a star has at most two bands. Okay? And now we can use this information. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so bands can only, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, this number is um, yeah, so the, uh, uh, well, for a given star, they are unique, yes. So because we, we, if we look at the combinatorics of a star, so we say we start at this square, we reflect on this square and on this square, and then we go to this square, then we can simply write this, uh, the locations of these bands as uh, two variables, and we get uh, an equation in those two variables which we can solve, and it gives a unique answer. Uh, for the case of the two corners being uh, in a situation that make uh, a triangle with the same length, uh, it can possible to have the same <coughs> Sorry? Sure. So, so okay. So, so uh, that's a, a degenerate case. So uh, we may assume that there's no degenerate cases. But also, uh, um, I wouldn't call this a bend because if a bend is on a corner, then uh, uh, we don't need to optimize anything. So by by a bend, I mean uh, a point that slides on an edge of a uh, of a square. Okay. So yeah. Sorry for the confusion. Yes. Uh, 
Sorry? Above? So, so these, these, these edges I'm drawing here, they are not real edges. They're just to indicate that these points are at uh, a certain distance from each other, and the same distance happens here and here and here. Okay, but it's really just a point set. So the, in any optimal solution, the, the points which are at exactly the same distance from each other, they will form a path. Yes, and this path, that's, uh, that's what I'm calling the star, and it has either one or two or three links. Okay, and so, uh, yeah, another observation is these, uh, these bands can only <coughs> occur at the extreme squares. So this square is extreme because its top edge is the lowest top edge of any square. And this square has, uh, is extreme because its left edge is the uh, rightmost left edge of any square. And uh, obviously, if there would be another square that's further to the right, then there would have to be a point in that square which would be further away from either this point or this point, uh, so we would not have a bend on, on, on the square. So they can only happen at uh, extreme squares. And uh, these angles at which they reflect have to be less than uh, 90 degrees. So, so this angle uh, and this angle and this angle, they all have to be smaller than 90 degrees because otherwise if I would have something that comes in and goes out in the same direction, then I could just move the points uh, and get a smaller, uh, smaller distance. Okay, so this is uh, some facts of properties that these bands must uh, obey. So now that we uh, observed this about the structure of these bands, now there's a, a a clear algorithm to compute the optimal band, namely, let's just try all possibilities. Um, we know that the optimal star has length at most four. It uses two uh, or one or zero um, band points, but these band points can only happen at the extreme squares, and there's only four possible extreme squares. And then there's two other points which happen at real squares, and there are a linear number of real squares, which means that there's a quadratic number of possible stars. And we can just compute all of these and then uh, find out which one um, is the, uh, the smallest one, uh, and then test whether it actually is a true solution. Okay, so um, we know the optimal star has at most two bands. Um, so we can compute the best star for every set of two extreme squares and two other squares, or one extreme square and two other squares, or zero squares, uh, extreme squares and two other squares, but th those will also be encountered if we just do this. Um, they're n squared of those stars that we have to compute. Um, and after this, we know the optimal diameter d and the stars that star that defines the optimal diameter, but this is still not quite good enough because now maybe we know that this is the optimal star, but then there's all these other squares and there's still points in there that we have to place in such a way that their distances to any point on these stars uh, is less than D. Otherwise, it would not be a valid solution. Okay? So this means now we have to uh, somehow find a way to place points in regions in such a way that they will be within diameter D of each other. So assume that we know D, how do we place all the points? Okay, so for this we can uh, take a different approach. So suppose this is our set of squares. Um, so some of them I just drew the corners. And um, I want to place a point on the top edge of this square such that uh, distance to all the other points is at most d. Okay, so what we can, uh, we can do is we just draw this uh, region of all the points that are distance d from this square. So it con consists of a straight line here and then a circular arc and then a straight line up here. And this curve intersects this bottom square uh, in some region and in particular it intersects the top edge of the bottom square somewhere. 
And this means uh, that if this is an x is extreme square, then uh, we know that uh, we must place a point here which is within distance d from this square, namely from any square, uh, which means that it has to be somewhere on this interval. Okay, so we know that the bottommost square, we will place a point somewhere on the top edge, but we can now restrict the uh, interval of possible placements to a smaller interval because if we would place it somewhere here, it would be too far away from this square. Okay? So we can compute this, uh, this interval for this square. And now we can look at another square and compute uh, the same thing, which will give us another interval. And, and this means we can now take the intersection of those two intervals and we get a smaller interval of possible placements um, for the, the bottommost point. Um, next we can look at uh, uh, the next square. So maybe the next square is one for which we don't know yet on which corner we have to place it. For example, because it's the topmost square. But we can still do the same thing. We can draw this region of points at distance d from this square and it will somehow touch this uh, uh, square in some uh, interval, which means that we again make a slightly smaller interval. And finally, there's one more uh, square for which we do this and we get uh, an even smaller interval. And then if we've done this for all squares, then we get some interval of placements that are still valid for uh, the bottommost extreme square. And now my claim is that if I do this for all the four extreme squares, uh, I get these intervals. And if I just place the points uh, anywhere inside these uh, intervals and at most d away from each other, then this will give me uh, a valid solution. Okay, so I place uh, some point in this interval and I claim that this is, uh, this is sufficient for um, computing the uh, a placement of points which has diameter at most d, assuming that d really is the right answer. Otherwise, of course, I will not find the solution. Okay. Um, yeah, so just to see what it looks like, suppose that this is my set of squares here. Um, and using this algorithm, I place all my axis extreme points. So for each point, I compute this interval and I place the points somewhere in these intervals. And now I still have to place all the other points, but this is actually easy because for every square, um, it's now clear that uh, I want to place my points somehow towards uh, the center. And what does this mean? Well, it means I can draw um, some vertical lines through my topmost and bottommost point and horizontal lines through my leftmost and rightmost point. And if I'm in the quadrant to the top right of here, then I always want to put my point in the bottom left uh, corner. If my square somehow intersects this, uh, uh, one of these strips, then I want to be inside the strip and as low as possible. So I place the points, for example, like this. So for this square, I put my point on a corner. For this one, I put it on a corner. For this big one, I just put it somewhere in the middle because uh, anywhere inside this middle rectangle will definitely not be uh, too far away from any other point. Um, so using this uh, uh, placement method, I always place my points as close as possible to all the other points. And since we assumed that uh, this is possible within distance d, then my final placement will have diameter d. OK, so this is uh, uh, optimal for the given placements on the axis extreme squares. Uh, and since we know that there is a solution of diameter d, uh, this point set must also have diameter d. So it's maybe not the only such point set, but it's a point set of diameter d. Okay. So this is uh, uh, a first algorithm to compute the smallest uh, diameter of a set of points in n squared time. Is this uh, somehow clear? apart from maybe some lemmas and claims that I haven't proved. But. So this way we can compute the smallest diameter of a set of squares in n squared time. 
but uh, this is not actually optimal yet. We can also do it faster because uh, for the second part of the algorithm, I really only used the value of the optimal solution and I didn't use the fact that I already knew the optimal star, which means we can use a technique that's called uh, parametric search, um, which uh, is a way to uh, optimize the value of a parameter that you don't know, so in this case d, uh, by just saying, okay, I assume that I do know d and I'm going to run my algorithm and then see if it gives me the right solution or not. And if it does, then maybe my value d was too small and I have to try a bigger one if it was, uh, but if it doesn't and it was too big and I have to try a smaller one and you uh, try to zoom in on the right value of d. Um, and you can do this uh, uh, using this parametric search technique with only a logarithmic overhead, um, depending on the set of possible uh, candidate values. Um, so we can also compute this in n log n time. Um, however, this approach really does not extend to arbitrary polygons or uh, to disks because it crucially uh, relies on this property I mentioned at the start that the star has at most two bends. And if my regions are not squares but can have uh, arbitrarily oriented, oriented uh, edges, then my stars can have any number of bends and then this, uh, this approach doesn't work anymore. Um, and for disks, it uh, certainly doesn't work. Um, so what can we do in those cases? Well, there are actually uh, approximation algorithms um, that run in polynomial time for uh, a given value of epsilon. So epsilon would be the approximation factor. So now I want to compute uh, a value of d that I know is within a factor one plus epsilon from the real uh, d. And I can still do this in polynomial time, but uh, it's not very efficient. And whether you can do better is uh, still an open question. Um, and also whether you can compute the solution exactly for disks, for example, is, uh, uh, is not clear. So I think that's the end of the diameter, yes. So any questions about uh, uh, the diameter part? Yes. So which claim? The, uh, this one? Yes. Um, so this claim uh, is, is really just a local observation. So it's uh, uh, if I have placed the topmost, the bottommost, the leftmost, and the rightmost points, so assume that these points are fixed, and now I want to place my other points in such a way that I minimize the diameter of the point set, then uh, what should we do for one point? Well, we can observe that any points within this middle square uh, or a rectangle must be within distance d from each of those four points because, uh, yeah, it's in between this strip and in between this strip. Um, if I can uh, place a point like on this square um, which intersects this strip and I want to minimize the distance to those four points, then uh, I clearly want to make it as low as possible to minimize the distance to this bottom point here. And then if I place it anywhere within this strip, um, well, to minimize the point distance to this point, I would have to put it on the right end of the strip, but it actually doesn't matter where I put it because wherever I put it on this line segment, I can observe that the distance from this point to this point will always be bigger than the distance from this point to this point. So if I can place my point anywhere in this strip, I'm already happy. Um, and for squares like this, where I, uh, um, I don't intersect either this strip or this strip, um, the observation is that, well, I don't know where I should place it in such a way that, uh, I don't know if I can place it in such a way that the distance to these other points is smaller than D, but if I assume that I can, then I know where to place it, namely I want to place it as far to the top left as possible because if I would place it anywhere on this edge, I could simply move it to the left, which will decrease the distance to 
this point and to this point, and maybe it increases the distance to this point, but since this point is much closer than that point anyway, that's, that doesn't matter. Okay, so that's, this, that's somehow the, the argument for these three different cases. Okay. Uh, questions about uh, diameter? Uh, yes. Uh, no, so this is the best known uh, time bound for approximation uh, for algorithm. The, for the boxes, boxes. Oh, for the boxes. But for the boxes, we can compute the optimal solution in n log n time. Oh. Oh, so you want to, to do it in linear time for an yes. approximation? Yes. No, I don't know about that. But, uh, somehow, n log n time is close enough to linear that uh, uh, I didn't try looking for approximation algorithms here. But uh, but yeah, I think this same approach probably also works for squares, but this is not really more efficient than n log n, except for uh, uh, very I large values of epsilon. Sorry, constant factor approximation. Um, I don't know. I d I didn't look into constant factor approximations. I think constant factor approximations for this type of problem are maybe less interesting because we are trying to compute the bounds of uh, a certain value and if the, if the largest and smallest possible value are close to each other um, and you take a constant factor approximation then the amount by which you approximate is maybe larger than the differ difference between the largest and the smallest value anyway and then it doesn't make so much sense anymore. So I think Approximation algorithms for this kind of problem really should be uh, one plus epsilon approximations to, to be useful in practice. Yes? Uh, I do not know. I uh, think that the main problem for disks is, uh, well, I think one problem is already uh, the algebraic nature of the solution. So you can, uh, Imagine if I have this kind of star shape that we saw here, then if this star has a linear number of uh, bands, then if I just write down the equations to place those points of the bands, then uh, I think this is, doesn't have an algebraic solution. So in that sense, we cannot compute the, the optimal solution um, even for al algebraic reasons. Um, if it's also MP-complete, um, well, it's definitely not MP-complete, but it might be MP-hard. Um, I don't know. I don't think so, but maybe. Any other questions about the diameter? If not, let's... Uh, move on to the width. So the width is a uh, um, slightly more complicated uh, measure than the diameter. And so as I mentioned, in the di diameter case, computing the largest diameter was easy because it's maximizing and maximizing measure, but computing the smallest diameter is much more complicated because we're minimizing a maximizing measure. But the width itself is a minimizing measure, right? You we want to minimize the distance between two lines that fit around the point set. Um, so we will see that minimizing the width is fairly easy, uh, but maximizing the width is harder. In fact, that actually is MP hard, and I will show a proof. But let's start with uh, minimizing the, uh, uh, the width. How? Oh. OK, so first uh, let's define the problem uh, once more, just to be on the same page. So we have a set uh, of imprecise points. And in this case, uh, we'll just start with uh, arbitrary polygonal re regions. Um, and we want to compute the smallest possible of the width, some measure on P. So what do we do? We place some points in these uh, regions. And then uh, the width of these points is this smallest strip that fits all the points inside. And it has a certain uh, value. And in this case, 
it looks kind of obvious that we cannot uh, compute the, uh, that we cannot make the width any smaller because this point cannot move into the strip and these points cannot move into the strip. And if I rotate this, then it's probably not going to be much smaller. Um, all right, okay. So, and we want to also compute the largest value, which in this case looks something like this. Um, and here you can already see that in the case of the largest value, uh, I pl place one point here and one point here and one point there. And um, the largest width is this distance. And here it's not so obvious that why this is optimal because it looks like this point I can just move down and then I get a bigger width. But it's not true because I've moved this down, then yes, the width of this strip gets wider, but then suddenly there's a completely different orientation in which there is a smaller width. So that's why the optimal solution may have a point that doesn't look locally optimal somehow. Uh, okay, so smallest and largest give this uh, interval of possible values which we would like to compute. All right, smallest uh, width. Um, the directional width of a region is the, uh, the width of the region in, in a given direction, okay? So if I have a certain direction here, um, for example, pointing to the left, then the directional width of this region is uh, the width of this vertical strip, um, which is defined by two vertices of this region, All right? That's in the directional width. And now I look at the, the sphere of direction. So, so this argument actually works in any dimension, but uh, let's just assume for now that we're talking about the two-dimensional case, so d equals two, but this argument works for any dimension. Um, so the sphere of directions can be subdivided into sections in which the same vertices define the directional width, okay? So in this direction, the width of this region is defined by those two vertices. But in a slightly different direction, the width is still defined by the same two vertices. But for some, uh, at some point, my width is going to be defined by a different pair of vertices. So at this particular direction, the width is defined by two vertices on one side and one on the other side. And if I move past it, then it's defined by two different vertices than it was in the beginning. And I can keep rotating in this sphere of directions until now I have two vertices on this side. Um, and I can mark these uh, directions on my sphere where the, uh, the, the combinatorial definition of the directional width changes. And I can uh, keep doing this until I've uh, gone through exactly half of my sphere. And then I can observe, well, the other half is actually just a copy of this half, but now, uh, blue arrows become red arrows on the other side because, well, this blue arrow meant that uh, my blue line had two points and now if I rotate 180 degrees, then suddenly, of course, the red line has, has two points. So this is, uh, this sphere of directions has this symmetric structure where every blue arrow has a red arrow uh, that goes in the other direction, right? And now any interval on this sphere of direction, or in higher dimensions it would be a cell, um, has the property that I have a unique pair of vertices that defines my directional width. All right? Okay, so uh, uh, I can subdivide my sphere in these intervals. And uh, the subdivision, you know, okay, in d dimensions has complexity d squared, so in, in two dimensions it's just constant complexity. Uh, assuming that my regions have a constant number of vertices, right? Um, okay, so what can we do with this uh, uh, sphere of directions to compute the smallest possible width? Well, the idea is very simple. We simply uh, consider now all of our regions, so not just one region, but the whole set. For each region, we compute the subdivision of the sphere of directions, and then we overlay them, okay? So we have... Uh, a sphere of direction, directions, and we overlay the subdivision for all of these regions, which means that in any of these intervals on this overlay, the directional width for every 
region is defined uh, by a given pair of vertices. Okay? And now within each cell in this sphere of directions, we compute the smallest possible width independently. Uh, so for example, if I look at this uh, interval in my sphere, then this defines two vertices for every uh, region, a blue and a red vertex, that together define my uh, directional width. And now, if I want to create a point set uh, by placing one point in every region that minimizes the width, and I'm using a width that lies somewhere in this interval of directions, uh, now I, it's suddenly very easy to do. It just means that I want uh, a line that lies above all of the red points and some line that lies below all of the blue points and they have to be parallel and the distance has to be minimized. So this is uh, now easy to do because I just have to uh, yeah, compute uh, this line that goes, uh, the, say the lowest line that goes through all my red points uh, and the highest possible parallel line that lies below all the blue points. And I do the same thing in the other direction. So this is the lowest, the highest possible line below the blue points and the lowest possible parallel red line that lies above all the red points. And in one of these two, one of these two will have a smaller width and that's the one that we uh, report. And we just do this independently for every cell in this overlay. And since the overlay had uh, 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 linear complexity, this means that um, uh, linear complexity, we have an overlay of n uh, spheres, each of which has constant complexity. So yes, with this, in two dimensions, this is linear complexity, um, which means that we can uh, find this uh, smallest possible width in uh, n log n time, because we still have to sort. Okay, so in, in d dimensions, uh, this will take two to the n to the two d minus one time. In one dimension, uh, it's actually more efficient than, uh, or in, in two dimensions, it's more efficient. So this would give n to the third, but we can actually do it in n log n time. Um, all right. Any questions about uh, computing the smallest uh, possible width? So this is kind of an overestimate of the of the running time in the case of d equals two. But these slides were uh, originally made for a higher dimensional case. Okay. Um, so the smallest possible width can still be computed uh, efficiently. However, the largest possible width is uh, a more complicated uh, situation. Um, so for the largest width, um, the largest width could be determined by uh, many triples of points keeping each other in balance. So this is somehow similar to the thing we saw for the diameter. Um, in the diameter case, we have these stars of points that are at the same distance. Uh, something similar can also happen with uh, the width. So for example, uh, assume that we have these regions. So of course these are not polygonal, they are disks, but it's uh, maybe easier to think about. So where would we place the points in such a set of disks to create the uh, largest possible width? So it's a symmetric situation. So somehow the solution probably has to be symmetric. So probably the points just have to be uh, on the far, far, far furthest points of all these disks, uh, furthest point from the center of the construction. And that's indeed uh, the optimal solution. Um, but why is this the optimal solution? So the, what, what is the width of this point set? Well, actually, if I try to measure the width of this point set, then it turns out that it's defined by uh, one line that goes through two of these points and one line that's parallel and goes through the point of the opposite end. But of course, this is not the only way we can choose 
such a triple of points, these three points also define the width because it's the same width. And uh, in general, we can look at all of these strips that have the same width. And why is this now optimal? Well, if I now try to take one of these points and move it a little bit, then it would increase the width of one triple. So for example, this triple here would have a width that increases if I move this point up, but then for uh, this triple here, the width would decrease if I move it up. And this is why I cannot move it up because I would decrease the overall width. And similarly, I can also not move it down. Um, so somehow these points are all keeping each other in balance by having five different triples that all have the same width. Um, and this observation is not limited to uh, disks. So if I replace these disks by polygons, um, right, so moving a point in any direction would decrease the width in at least one direction. So we cannot move any point. Um, but if I replace these disks by polygons, oh, I don't have polygons. If I replace them by polygons, then uh, the same thing, thing still happens. So it's not the fact that these are disks that make it hard. It's just the fact that we can have these points that keep each other in balance. Um, and the number of such points balancing each other can be, uh, uh, in principle, unbounded. Um, and this is the reason why it turns out that computing the largest width in RD, uh, actually in R2 already, is MP hard. Okay, so um, yeah, I will give uh, uh, this hardness proof. Um, it's already hard for polygonal regions. In fact, it's already hard if my regions are line segments of arbitrary orientations. Um, and I will give the proof uh, for this case, but it can be also extended to, to different cases. All right. So, to prove that this problem is MP hard, we will do a, a, a reduction, of course, as in any hardness proof. Um, but before I describe the reduction, we'll just uh, first make some sort of a, a skeleton construction in which we are going to uh, make this proof work. So, I start with taking a huge number of points and evenly spread them on a circle. So my huge number I denote by capital N, and N is somehow going to be polynomial in the size of uh, the problem I'm reducing to, but, uh, but it can be very big. So for example, uh, it may look like this. So here I'm assuming that five is a huge number. If, if you don't agree, you can imagine there are more points here. Um, but with five, it's a bit easier to draw the construction. So, so let's say five is huge. Um, and let D be the uh, largest distance between two of these points. So of course, they're evenly spread on a circle. So this distance um, happens in many uh, locations, for example, between these two points. This distance I call D. And the idea is going to be that we're going to build something which has either width bigger than D or width smaller than D, uh, and making this decision is uh, uh, going to be MP hard. Um, okay, so given these five points, I'm going to define two different regions. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, what I call a regular N arc gone. So this connects all my points together with circular arcs like this. So what are these arcs? Well, this arc here is exactly a piece of the circle that's centered at this point and which connects this point to the next point. And similarly, from uh, this point, I take a circle that connects this point to this point. So this is the arc of all points at distance exactly d from this vertex. This arc is the set of points at distance exactly d from this vertex. So I get this arc gone, which has n circular arcs, right? And you can already observe that the width of this figure <laughs> is exactly d in every possible direction, right? Second thing I want to define is a regular 2n gone. 
So this is not an argon, but a polygon. And uh, it has two n vertices, n of which coincide with the ones I had before. And uh, the other n are in between them. So this is a regular 2n gon. And uh, an observation I want to make about this 2n gon is that it also has width d, not in every direction, but uh, if you minimize the direction, then the width will be d because, for example, the distance between this segment and this segment here will be exactly d because this uh, dotted line is perpendicular to those two lines. And uh, so the distance between any pair of opposite edges of these two angles is the same. It's always d, right? And another thing you can observe here already is that uh, the tangent of this circular arc here is exactly the same as the uh, direction of the two angle, right? So this is the, the two shapes that I'm uh, building. And now the rough idea of the hardness proof will be to, uh, uh, okay, so indeed, both of these shapes have width d. And the rough idea of the proof is that we're gonna make some construction where uh, we're gonna be able to place some points and regions in such a way that the convex hull of those points is uh, contained in the two angon but contains the arc gone. And if this is the case, if I make some shape that's somehow in between those two, then obviously it will have width d because both of these shapes have width d. So anything in between them also has width d. Um, so I'm, that's going to be my goal, to make a shape that's in between those two. But if I fail, because it somehow uh, takes a shortcut and cuts off some part of the arc gone, then this means I have some direction where the width is smaller than d. Okay, so I will have some set of shapes somehow. Maybe they look like this. And all the shapes are contained in the uh, two n gone which means that the convex hull is always going to be contained in the two angle. But the question is, can I now place my points in such a way that the convex hull contains the archegon, yes or no? So maybe I place my points something like this, right there. So this is one point per region. For this region, I place my point down here. And now for this region, I place the point up here. And for this region, I place the point here. So every point has one, every region has one point. Now I take the convex hull of these points. And now I, I check, well, it's not really working because uh, here this part is not uh, containing the arc gone, which means that this little uh, gap here causes my uh, red convex hull to have a width smaller than D. Um, namely, if I draw a parallel line here and a line through this point, it has a width smaller than D. And uh, the observation is that anyway I draw some polygon that does not contain the arc gone, it will always have a diameter, uh, sorry, a width of smaller than d. But if, a, if it does contain the archon, then it has width d. Right? Is that uh, somehow clear? Okay, so then uh, how are we gonna turn this into a hardness proof? Um, yeah, okay, so this is what I just said. If we can place the point such that the convex hull contains the archon, then the maximum width of the regions is at least d. Um, so we're going to reduce from uh, satisfiability, or also known as set. Uh, does everybody know what set is? Does anybody not know what set is? Okay, good. So we'll uh, just work from there. So we have a, a set of uh, variables and a set of clauses, and we need to somehow encode them in this problem. Um, so the reduction I'm going to make uh, will be for line segments, but it can be extended also to axis-aligned rectangles. Um, so I'm going to place somehow a set of line segments in this region, which have their endpoints in these uh, uh, these pockets here. Um, and maybe uh, you can also do it with rectangles. Um, however, for example, for squares, the problem is too open, so the hardness proof doesn't work. Um, also for, for circles, it doesn't work. Okay, so let's do the hardness proof for line segments. So I'm gonna draw these uh, uh, pictures um, that have line segments 
between these regions, but uh, maybe it's easier to give them some names. So I'm going to call such a region between the, uh, the two angon and the argon a uh, party hat. Okay, so um, this here is a party hat. Um, and because it's a little bit hard to draw in this party hat because it's so flat and narrow, uh, or flat and broad, I guess, uh, I'll just uh, zoom in on my picture a little bit. So I'm just going to stretch the picture like this and then maybe move it a bit to the center. Um, but this is just for exposition purposes. So I don't actually stretch my party hats. I, I, I just draw the picture as if they are stretched. But you imagine that anything I draw uh, has to be squished in the actual construction. OK, so here we have a, a, a party hat. That's, uh, make it a bit bigger. And um, for the reduction, we will uh, uh, define two kinds of party heads. So we will have uh, variable party heads, and we will have class party heads. Okay, and they will encode the variables and the classes of my set formula. All right. Variable party head. Always wanted to have a slide that's called variable party head. Uh, okay, so we have this party head here, and we're going to make a, 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 we're going to encode a variable of the uh, three set formula. So remember, we want to make some construction here that has a convex hull which contains this arc, but is contained within this uh, polygonal uh, path. So the idea is that we put one segment within this party head. Okay, so we place one segment here, and it just has one end on this edge and one end on this edge. And if I now place one point on this uh, segment, then if I place it here, then my convex hull will be exactly tangent to the arc on this side, but it will cross the arc on the other side. And if I place it here, it will be tangent on this side, but cross the arc on the other side. And if I place it somewhere in the middle, then it crosses the arc on both sides, right? And now uh, I'm going to place two sets of points very close to the arc on one on this side and one on this side, uh, like here. So I place some very small points here. Maybe they're a bit hard to see, but that's, that's okay because these points are actually the endpoints of segments. So the segments go off somewhere into the rest of the construction. So I have some segment which has an endpoint here, very close to my arc, and which goes away somewhere into a different party head somewhere. Uh, and I have um, a bunch of those segments. And now the observation is that in order to make uh, the convex hull of the points that I place contain the argon, uh, I have two choices. I can either choose to uh, use the left end of my variable segment, so I can place a point here. Um, but then I need to use all of these points up here to make sure that my convex hull still contains the arc. Okay, so I can place a point here, and 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 then the convex hull nicely contains my arc. But if I would leave out any of these points up here, then I would create a shortcut which cuts through the arc, which means that I would have a width smaller than D. So I have to use all of these points if I choose the left one. Or I can choose uh, the right one, and then uh, I have to choose all these points here that are uh, um, close to my arc. So I have two possible solutions for my party head. One of them uses this point and all of these points, and the other one uses this point and all of these points. Of course, I can use more of these points if I want, but I cannot leave out any of these points if I make this choice. Okay, so I've, there are two possible solutions for a variable party head, and these will uh, encode the two different values of one of my variables in the set instance. So um, I'm going to say, if I choose this point here, then I call my variable true. If I choose this point here, then I call my variable false. Right? So that's the, the variable party head. So let's move on to the class party head. So somewhere else in my construction is going to be another party head, uh, which is a class party head. Um, a class party head also has a construction, but uh, it's much simpler than the variable party head. I'm just going to put lots of endpoints of 
uh, segments at the tip of this party head, like this. And now uh, the observation is that if I want to make the convex hole of my points contain this argon, then I have to place some vertex at the tip. I mean, I, I cannot place it anywhere else on the segments because then it will intersect the arc. So it has to be at the tip. Um, and it doesn't matter in which of these segments I place an endpoint at the tip, but in at least one of them, I have to place a point at the tip of this party head. Okay. Um, now what are these segments? Well, these segments are actually the other ends of the segments that we just saw in the variable party head. Uh, so each of these segments goes into a variable party head somewhere. And this means that I can only place a point at the end of such a segment if I didn't have to place the point at the other end, because I can only place one point on every segment. All right? So uh, if a variable occurs negatively in this class of my set instance, then I'm going to connect a segment uh, from the tip of this party head to the true set uh, of my variable party head. And if the point, uh, if a variable occurs positively in this class, then I'm going to, cr to connect a, a segment from the tip of this party head to the false set of my variable. Which means that if I set my variable to true, then uh, um, I cannot place a point uh, at this tip because I have to use the other point in the true uh, set of the, uh, the class, uh, which means I cannot satisfy this class using that segment, which makes sense because uh, the variable occurred negatively in this class. So I can only satisfy it if the variable was false. All right? So to satisfy a class, at least one of the variables uh, that's connected to this class must have the correct value. So, so if the literal appears positively, it must be set to true. Or if a literal appears negatively, it has to be set to false. And otherwise, this class will not be satisfied. OK, so to look at this more globally, uh, this is my, uh, my big picture again. I have all these party heads uh, going around a circle. And I have these, uh, these segments. So maybe this here is a variable, and this is the true set, and this is the false set. And these true segments connect to a bunch of different classes, and the false ones connect to uh, another set of classes. And uh, maybe I put all my variables here on the left and the classes on the right. And now if I want to know if there is a solution that has a convex hole that contains the argon, um, I have to basically solve my set problem. Yes? Sorry, if you, you, if you would place a point here and a point there? Yes, that's true, but you can only place one point in every segment. Right, because every segment is one of our imprecision region, regions, and inside every region we get to place one point. So if I place a point here, then I cannot also place a point there, because I can only place one point on this, uh, on this segment. Yeah, is that, uh, that's kind of essential for the, uh, for the, uh, for the proof. So. Yes, yeah, I'm not sure I understand your, your question, but uh, uh, so, so if, I, if I want to create some uh, convex uh, chain that contains this archon, 
then I have to make sure that uh, uh, I either use all of these points and this point, or all of these points and this point, because I, I can only place one point on this segment up there. Yes? So. Then I'm not sure I understand your question. Okay, sure, yes, no problem. Okay, yes? How many points do you need on this here? On this one? Um, you, can, you can choose, so uh, you can just use as many points as you need for the classes, um, because if you place them slightly further away from the arc, then you need fewer points to still create a convex chain that uh, contains the arc. But if you need more points, then you can place them closer to the arc. So the, uh, the property we need for this kind of arc here, maybe I can also draw it, is uh, we have some part of an arc, and we create some construction like this, where we just, just touch the arc between every connection. And if I would leave out any of these points, then I would intersect the arc. But uh, if I want to use more points, then I simply place them closer to the arc. Okay. Yes? Sorry? Uh, the optimal charge yes. is made for uh, computing the geometer in the square. Yes. Why is it not uh, supposed to be here for the outer uh, uh, the, the star algorithm for the squares, you want to try to use it to solve the width problem? Okay, yeah, it's possible. So this, this, uh, uh, this algorithm here, or this hardness proof, is for uh, um, access, uh, is for uh, uh, line segments with arbitrary orientations. Uh, actually, it, it, it also extends to rectangles. So, um, So yeah, no, I think actually it's not possible. So the, uh, uh, the algorithm for computing a star or any idea like that cannot work because uh, uh, for computing the diameter, it works for axis lined rectangles, but for width, this is an MP hard problem. So um, why doesn't it work? Well, um, I think it's just, it, there are two different problems, the uh, width and the diameter are somehow different in nature. And, uh, I don't see a reason why an algorithm for one would help you to solve the other problem. So. Yes? Yes. Yeah, that's a very good point. So this only works if uh, my my big N here. Uh, where's my big N? This big N here has to be an odd number, otherwise uh, the construction doesn't work. But that's okay because we just have to choose N big enough that we have enough party hat for all the uh, vert the clauses and the variables of our set instance. So we can choose it bigger than we need. So we can just pick an odd number. Yes? Uh, why is it polynomial? So uh, if you look at the end result, um, mm -hmm. so here 
the, if we now count at uh, the number of segments that we actually used, then we can see that um, every segment here, every long segment connects some class, uh, some variable of the set instance to some class of the set instance. So the number of long edges is the, uh, uh, it's the number of uh, uh, class variable incidences in the set instance, which is polynomial. And then we also use some extra segments for every variable, but that's also a polynomial number. And we have uh, an extra fixed point on this outside. And there's big N of those, but we can choose big N so that's also polynomial. And then finally, we may have to uh, make sure that the coordinates of all the points are uh, polynomially expressible um, in the size of the input. And this is uh, uh, yeah, some more algebraic details, which I'm uh, uh, kind of ignoring here, but, uh, but this is doable. So we can just uh, choose the coordinates by placing a sufficiently fine grid over the whole construction and using only grid coordinates. Yes, you, it, it should be an odd number. You're correct. This figure is not right. <laughs> Very uh, good observation. Yes, any other uh, questions about this uh, hardness proof? Yes. In your construction, some of the coordinates are empty. What is their uh, So the ones that, uh, that are empty, we just don't use, so we can just put a fixed point at the tip to make sure that uh, uh, the convex hull will contain those regions. So they don't have a, a, a reason uh, for being there, but we may need them, for example, because we have to have an odd number of uh, party heads in total. Any more questions? Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, all I uh, was saying about uh, the width. So let's see how we are. What is the time? We are out of time already? Ah, oh, really? Okay. Sorry, I was not, uh, not aware of this. I thought somehow we, maybe because yesterday I was talking on the half hour and today on the full hour. Okay, so I have to skip uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, the lecture. So I wanted to give another hardness proof. I just show you the pictures. This is what it looks like. <laughs> Any questions about that one? <laughs> and then I have some, some uh, other open problems. Okay, no more questions. <laughs>